Harold, H-A-R-O-L-D, middle initial A, Beck, B-E-C-K. When were you born? January the 2nd, 1928. And where were you born? Isabel, South Dakota. Isabel, could you? Isabel, I-S-A-B-E-L, South, South Dakota. South Dakota. Wow. Tell me about the days that you were growing up with your family, your siblings. Well, we left South Dakota during the Depression with uh, unable to farm anymore and moved to Washington State when I was nine years old. And we, th there we started a dairy farm and started out at milking six, eight cows up to when I left home at 21, we were milking about 120 cows every day. Wow. And then I started uh, traveling and working just to get away from the farm. I didn't want farm anymore. <laughs> you didn't like it. I didn't like it. You Too much everyday work. Never had a day off, night or mornings or anything. Is that right? No, no time off from farming. Uh, no. Tell me about your siblings and your family. I come from a rather large German family. And uh, I had a total of 11 siblings. Wow. And I was the second oldest. Mm. So naturally, a lot of the responsibility was on I and my brother, brother, older brother. And from there on, I had, I had five sisters and six brothers. And uh, we farmed there in Dakota, or in Washi Washington State, until uh, till sh shortly before the Korean War broke out, I traveled with a buddy of mine just to get away and do things. When, when did you finish your school? I finished high school in uh, 1946. What school? Ferndale, Washington. Could you spell Ferndale, it? Ferndale, F-E-R-N-D-A-L-E. That's in Washington. Mm -hmm. And then you've been traveling around? I've been, I started traveling around from 1946 until 1950 when the Korean War broke out. And then that's when I decided, well, those first people that are being drafted are going to go right to the front lines. So I went down and joined the Army Air Corps. So you enlisted? I enlisted. Where? In Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. I enlisted in the Army Air Corps. There was no Air Force then yet. And uh, so instead of doing three years, I had, done, had to sign up for four. So when did you exactly, do you remember? Uh, August 22nd, 1950. How did you live on by traveling around? You said that you were sick and tired of farming and yeah. you didn't have enough money, right? How no. did you, how did you? We just traveled and worked, I and a buddy, the buddy that I met, we traveled and we done anything we could do to get money. Worked on wheat farms, dairy f or uh, chicken farm, cotton farms, potato farm. So Whatever. you're still working on farming, right? We were still working in farming, traveling and farming, worked at the oil well for a while. Anything we could do to get money, to travel and keep going. Any particular place that you still remember that was really good? Oh, yes. There's big oil well fire worked at in Big Springs, Texas. Worked 21 days, and being as it was an emergency, we both cleared uh, uh, over $2,100. Ah. That, uh, and that was a lot of money in those days. Must have been an experience to you, right? Oh, yes. We had a lot of experience. We drove trucks. We drove bulldozers on the farms and on the, in the oil fields. When did you come to know about the breakout of Korean War and how? It was when my buddy got his draft notice and I knew I was, or re-enlistment notice, and I knew that I was getting mine next. So uh, that's when I went down and joined the Army Air Corps. Did you know anything about Korea? No. 
I never, never heard of Korea. I was just, you know, out of high school, doing nothing and traveling for three years, and we didn't, uh, didn't keep up on the news. So you didn't know anything about Korea, where it was? No. No. Okay. And and you you came to know about the Korean War. Were you not nervous or afraid that you might drag into the war and being killed? Oh yes, because uh, but then it was a, a matter of being drafted or enlisting, and I figured if I got enlisted, I would have a choice of where I went, rather than them sending me into the army sector of it. And uh, I joined the Army Air Corps, and uh, instead of going to the front lines, I went 120 miles ahead of them, <laughs> which was uh, good choice. Yeah. So, but I did have a warm bed and a roof over my head every night, even though it was just a bunker or a tent, instead of sleeping in a trench. So where did you go to get the basic military training? I left Seattle, Washington, went by train to San Antonio, Texas, and was there for, should have been six weeks, but I spent five weeks there and then got shipped out to a trade school in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, what was, did, what it, did you learn there? It was uh, basic telephone and uh, radio communications. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for uh, uh, nine months. All right. And then got shipped out to uh, uh, San Bernardino, California, Norton Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we got uh, further training and on-hands experience mm -hmm. and stayed there for a, a year and a, about a year. And then when I got my notice to go overseas. What did you learn from Nor Norton Air Base? It was just basic communications and how, to, uh, uh, how all the radar equipment worked and on-hands, uh, radar, telephone, whatever. And when did you leave for Korea? In, uh, I think it was September of 1952. From where to where? Went, uh, left out of uh, uh, Pittsburgh, California, went by uh, troop boat to Yokohama, Japan. Uh -huh. And from Yokohama, Japan, we flew into uh, Seoul, Seoul, Korea, or Kimpo. Kimpo. Yeah. What was your unit? Uh, I was with the uh, 5th Air Force, and we were with the uh, 608th A ACNW. What's ACNW? It's... Uh, Air Force or Air Warning Communication Communication Systems. Yeah. So tell me about the first impression of Korea when you landed in Kimpo in in 1950, 52. In 52, we, my first impression was as we went through town. Gee, those buildings are all shot up. They said, "Well, they've changed hands three different times. No wonder their buildings are all shot up." And then we went on out to uh, Seoul Air, our Air Base there. And my first impression was when we crossed the river, there was some men hanging off the bridge. And I said, wh and next morning I said, why don't they take those people down? They said, they do every morning. They take those people down, put new ones up there. These were North Koreans that they were hanging. And that was my first impression. That's the dead bodies. Yes, that were there. People just hanging these dead bodies over the bridge. Yes. For what? Th I don't know. But they hung. They would. Uh, these was North Koreans or somebody that they uh, were some kind of uh, atrocities. So I, t uh, this guy says, well, they take them down every morning. So I and another guy, we went down the fence line as far as we could 
to watch that bridge at, uh, in the morning. And sure enough, here come a big truck out there. And that was my very first impression of Korea. Atrocity. Yes. And the, the downtown Seoul from Kimpo into Seoul Air Base, how everything, there was nothing that was in, you know, usable and how hard the people were trying to make a go of it there. And Did we were riding on the back of a deuce and a half truck going from Kimpo into Seoul. Did you see Korean people in the street? Oh, yes. Tell me about how do they look? They were uh, busy. What got to, me, uh, got to me is they had their oxen and their uh, horses tied at the curb and yet the little bit of water that was running down the curb, they, they were washing some of their fruits and vegetables, not realizing, I guess, or the only water that they had to uh, wash these fruits and vegetables and get, get something to eat. But it, my first, first memory in the soul was then I stayed in the Seoul for two days before I they flew me north into Chodo. 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 Where is it, Chodo, for the audience? Chodo is uh, about 128 miles north of the 38th parallel. It's a small island on the west coast of Korea, about two and a half miles off the Korean North Korean shore. Mm -hmm. And there we had a, uh, a early warning radar system. We controlled all the, our unit controlled all the F-86s and planes that went up over North Korea. How many were in the Jodo of your team? There were probably about 35 all total. Mm -hmm. What kind of equipment? We were had... Uh, uh, Air Force there, and we had a f four, four or five Marines, and uh, they were for our gunnery protection. Mm -hmm. And uh, radar, radar. What kind of radar? Oh, I don't, I don't remember what kind it was. We had uh, we were sitting right out on the point, just facing North Korea there, and uh, that's where we. Uh, controlled all the planes that went up over Migali, plus any jet that got shot down would try to make it back as far as our island for rescue. And we had a PT boat there for go out and rescue, plus a helicopter. Um, did you see many North Korean mix? Were you able to I, I did see one or two, but mostly it was, uh, it would watch it on radar, you'd see them there, right. the blip. How but, uh, often and how many, for example? Oh, they would be mostly at night that we'd uh, see them or spot them, but we had uh, a lot of uh, what we called was bed check charlies. Yeah. They come in there to disrupt our, our uh, radar operations. They would come in low right on the water so that our radar couldn't detect them and they'd be just over the top of us before we knew it. And they would drop hand grenades or a phosphorus bomb or just drop a bomb. There were little bi-wing planes that come right in 10 feet off the water. Could you spell that Bad Chuck Charlie for the audience? Bad Chuck Charlie? Yeah. He was a, a little biplane that flew real low right over the water and he uh, and then come up over our, our island and to drop phosphorus bomb or drop a, a, a regular bomb or hand grenades, anything to disrupt us. And we had to quickly, when we heard them, had to quickly turn out the lights. Was it MiG or different aircraft? The bed check Charlie was just a little biplane, a small plane that flew right on the water. But it's the like MiG, a glider. Oh, Was it? The, the what? Was it like a glider? It was a, like a small crop duster. So it's not MiG? No, no, these weren't, these weren't MiGs that were coming in to disrupt us. And could you spell it? 
Bed Chuck Charlie. Bed, bed Check Charlie. They always come in at bedtime. Bedtime. Bed. B E D. B E D. Not B A D. No. Bed Check Charlie. They come in at right at bedtime or there. And uh, why is it Bed Chuck Charlie? Bed Check Charlie. Because they always come in to, to harass us just about uh, time for the bed check, just time getting dark. And we'd turn out all the lights, Every all the lights turned out. And uh, then they used these lights, put them on the edge of a cliff over there, just at the, at the uh, near the bottom of the cliff. Well, bed check Charlie didn't realize that, and he flew right into the cliff one night. Tell me about the enemy Air Force. Was it really there? Was it really... Strong, or tell me about it. The enemy air force would come down and uh, harass the American troops, and uh, then as soon as uh, the F-86 Sabers or American planes would get on them, they would dash over across the Yellow River, and uh, our radar was not supposed to follow them there, and so it was always uh, lost in flight. As soon as our F-86s would get on the tails of the, of the MiG-15s, they'd dash across the river and we'd always have to uh, record them as lost in flight until they come back across, then we'd pick them up again. So the, all those MiG-15 originated north of Yalu River, right? North of the Yalu River. Was yeah. that Chinese or Russian? I don't know. I didn't know for sure whether it was Chinese or Russian. I, I heard it was a combination of both. Both? Yes. Was not North Korean though? No. No. And what was the forces of uh, North Korean, I mean the enemy's air force compared to, to United Nations and the Americans? Was it really big? Do they really kind of uh, com in competition in some sense fair? Was they, it strong, weak? Tell me about the assessment of your... Uh, what, what I saw on radar and so on was uh, the... Were what the, I heard and what I read is that the enemy's air force was really weak compared to the United Nations. Yes, they, they were weak and our planes could outmaneuver the F-86. I watched that on the... Uh, our F-86 could outmaneuver the MiG-15s, which I watched on radar sometimes as they would... They'll get into fights and get into dog fights and shoot each other down. But uh, I was over there the day that uh, we had the one defector, and we carried him on radar, clear down into Seoul, landed on the airfield the wrong way. And uh, I was on uh, duty that day, and uh, someplace along the line where they, they got orders or had that uh, to uh, that this plane was defecting because he broke clear away from all the rest of the troops and happened to be in the Air Force command unit the day that there at uh, Chodo, the day that he defected. So, and you were in Chodo, right? Yes, on yeah. Chodo Island. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the life there in Chodo. Where did you sleep? What did you eat? We had uh, our radar unit was out on the end. We had to come up over a, a a little, quite a hill, and there was our compound was in there, our living quarters. We had a uh, oh a big uh, uh, cafeteria there, uh, mess hall, and then we had a big storage unit, and the rest of it was. Uh, just tents and bunkers that we slept in. And if you were lucky enough to uh, be able to trade for somebody that already had built a bunker, well, you could get that, and you'd have sandbags up on around everything. But uh, And it was walking up and down this hill two, three times a day to get to the radar unit or the communications units, and then back to the mess halls again. But we had to have somebody on duty all the time in our communications deal. And uh, we had uh, uh, five people that were helping us into the, with the communications, keep all the lines between the radar and the communications radios open. 
And if we got shelled or anything, then all of those uh, uh, lines would be cut or, or shrapnel in them, and we'd have to replace them. And uh, that was quite a challenge sometimes. How was weather? Cold. Even in the island? Yes. Mm. Got pictures of ice flows that were 15, 20 feet high. Saw the ocean where it was froze over. Saw them trying to walk across from uh, North Korea to our island, and then they went, had to go through there with, uh, with boats to break that ice up. And it had uh, tremendous tides, big tides over there. 15, 20 feet, foot tides at times. So our uh, plane that uh, brought supplies in was C-46 or a C-47, uh, and they landed on the beach on low tide. Huh. Without runway? Yes. We didn't have a runway on our island. Yeah. They would land on the beach on low tide, and they were always full of uh, uh, big ice flows. C-54, right? C-54 and, and C-47, C-46 was the, were our main planes. And um, they, they come from uh, other bases, would fly about 10 feet off the water. I mean, you'd think sometime when you're going up there that the, the waves, the splash was going to hit your plane on the bottom. Yeah. Were there any Koreans in Jodo? There was... Uh, a little village down there, there were probably uh, maybe 150 Koreans on the island. And what was the relationship with them? Uh, most of them were uh, farmers on the island, and uh, quite a few of them worked for the Air Force there. Had, uh, had all the houseboys and the and, uh, uh, women that done done the laundry for the GIs. That, mm -hmm. that, uh, House boys would take down to them. How much did you pay for laundry and houseboy? We generally paid them in uh, uh, rations that we got, but uh, because we weren't supposed to pay them in uh, in American script, and uh, while we were over there, the the Korean money devaluated so much. I mean, they would bring in a shoebox of money to buy a, a sack of flour. <laughs> And uh, uh, I remember when it devalued, they canceled all the old money out and give them all this new money. And it was, it was quite, a, quite an exchange and took a while, and it was real confusing for everybody to cash in this money. I've still got quite a bit of it. Yeah, I want to see that. But, uh, and you have a very unusual pictures that you, you yourself took with your friends and that's really valuable to show how Korea was 65 years ago to yeah. the young generations yeah. here in the United yes. States. So I appreciate that you brought the memorabilia with you. Um, how was their life, Koreans there in Jodo? Were they s severely suffered from the war mm -hmm. or do they were sort of isolated because they are in the small island? Well, they, were, they were they were sort of isolated, but they, they were they were hard workers. When uh, we would uh, the government would bring in a LST for supplies for the Koreans, and they'd bring one in for the for the GIs, and we'd uh, the uh, Americans would pay the Koreans in in rice sometimes. So they'd bring in these two LSTs, and the Koreans could unload their LST quicker by manual labor on their backs and shoulders than the GIs could with trucks, having the Koreans load the trucks and unload them. They could unload that LST quicker. Were they good? They were fast and worked hard. Um, so what were you thinking when you were there in Chodo and you didn't know anything about Korea before and you were there uh, detecting and follow, keep tracking all those North, I mean, enemy air force. What were you thinking to yourself? Gee, we, we would think, well, 
are they, are they going to win? How can they win no more than these people have right here? How can what little that the Koreans are doing there on that island, how could that help the North Koreans? But we had, we had houseboys there that uh, were 15, 14, 15 years old that we found afterwards were, he was a, he was a traitor. And they, would, they caught him at night picking all, all this information that he would uh, get from the GIs and then he was radioing it to somebody else. I got pictures of that little houseboy. Radio? Well, uh, they'd uh, do, so li they would tap some of our lines, our communication lines for the telephone, and uh, they would, they would, they were transmitting that, uh, that by a, a small radio. That means that he was North Korean spy? Yes. How, how is that happening? I mean, he uh, was not coming from North Korea, right? He was there in Chodo, right? Yes, but his brother was in North Korea. I wrote a letter every night home to my wife. Oh, you were married? I got married just before I went overseas. I got married on a Christmas vacation. And I got married just before I went overseas so my wife could get benefit. Do you know his name? Uh, All I remember was Kim. When did you leave Chodo? I left Cho Chodo in uh, November of 1953. And? From there, I uh, picked up my wife in uh, San Bernardino, California, and my next base was Eglin, Florida. So when did you arrive in California? In... Uh, we come back on a, uh, I didn't, didn't want to come back by plane because our planes had a real poor record there. And uh, so I come back uh, on a regular troop ship into uh, San Francisco. When was it? It was in uh, November, November Still of 53. And you met your wife there? Yes. Tell me about it, that the day that you met back I, her. I met her and we went down, bought a brand new car, went on a 30-day vacation, leave, and then I had to report to Eglin, Florida. Have you been back to Korea? No. Do you know what happened to Korea now? Yes. Tell me. Well, we what see do you know? That I've seen a, a lot of pictures and different people that have gone back there on their revisit program. But uh, I've, uh, my wife never did want to fly overseas, so I could never get her to go with me. So uh, I never did go back to Korea. And uh, since then, why, uh, my wife is gone after 60 years. Oh, I'm sorry. Harold, would you please show the picture of that houseboy Kim? You said there was North Korean spy. He please, was up to your chin. Oh. Kim was our houseboy. He was houseboy at several uh, different tents and bunkers there. And uh, one night somebody caught him on the radio tapping a telephone line and radioing the information to somebody else. And they took him away and never seen him since. Never did see him after that. Mm. Was, was you close to him? Oh yes, he done. He washed, uh, had my clothes washed, made my bunk, swept the floor oh, in boy. our tents and our bunkers. That's very unfortunate. And uh, he uh, wrote me a letter explaining where his family lived, and uh, it took me years to have that letter interpreted. And uh, I'm not really sure whether whoever interpreted actually told me what was on there because they stammered and stuttered for quite a bit reading that letter and, and uh, explaining it to me. And you still keep the letter that written by him to your wife? Yes, I've had that for over 60, 60 plus years. We should have that letter scanned. Students from high school can learn Korean there is a good motivation for them to learn Korean and decipher what he wrote to your wife. What is the legacy of Korean War veterans? 
Oh, I don't know. What do you think is the contribution that you and other young American men and women did make to Korea and for the relationship between these oh, two countries? I, I think that uh, if uh, the American people had not went over there to help Korea, they would be in the same position as North Korea is right today, which would be a dictator rulership. And uh, the people of South Korea have really taken a hold and helped themselves. What do you think about the future of Korea, North and South? Do you think it will be reunified or what will happen, do you think? It's, it's hard for me to say. I think that uh, South Korea will keep on advancing. They're making tremendous advances and they're doing a lot of it on their own. Uh, industries that they're developing. And uh, I do know that uh, some of the products that we receive are as good, if not better, than a lot of the American-made products. Thank you very much again. And please share your memorabilia with my foundation so that they can learn from you. Okay. Would you do that? Yeah. <laughs>